All right. Um, I'm going to go on to speaker view. Hello, welcome to the people who are tuning in now. Thank you so much for joining us on what day of the week of it. It is Tuesday, April 14th. I don't know what month it is. I don't know what year it is. My staff and I were just talking about Super Tuesday, which seems like a million years ago, but it was like about a month ago. Um, my name is Manny. Thank you for tuning in to Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations. Um, I own a small business on the corner of 16 and Valencia, which is boarded up right now, and it's really sad. Um, we gather people together with civic programming. Unfortunately, because of shelter in place, we had to shut down, but the work is not over, so we're bringing civic programming to you through the internet and through amazing, extremely handsome, well-hydrated people just like the man above me or to around me. Uh, Peter Andrews is a friend of mine, a wine expert, and just a wine lover, basically. So a couple housekeeping things. If you have any questions for Peter um, about the history of wine and the wine industry and what's going on with wine right now, you can just type it into the Q&A box at any time. I see some people are already typing in things to the Q&A box. Thank you for being active participants. Um, you can tag us at Welcome to Manny's as well. And if at any point you're feeling kind of juicy and you want to make a contribution to my small business, you can do that in the answered section of the Q&A box. There's a little link to become a sponsor of Manny's. All right, Peter, I know you've prepared, I know you've done your, you prepared a whole moment for us on the history of wine. But before we do that, I want um, to tell me about your most, um, I want you to tell me about, what is your warmer? My, I'm sorry, my, my computer broke up, my internet broke up as soon as you asked that question. What, what is that? <laughs> what, is your, what is your warmest memory? My warmest memory? Oh, man. Well, it, it's kind of related to wine, but um, I remember when I was 20 years old, I moved to Italy uh, to go cook in this Michelin star kitchen um, that was in a 14th century castle. And uh, I was, I was asked, I was in cooking school still at the time, and I was asked by the chef I was working for in Rhode Island, do you want to go cook in Italy? And so I said, yes, I bought a ticket the next day. And then I left two weeks later. Wow. I had never been out of the country before. I didn't speak a single word of Italian. Um, I remember when I was asked, uh, or when I was, when I was said hello by the person who picked me up at the train station to bring me to my like quarters, she, you know, she said, buongiorno. And I was so nervous. I remember I said back to her, bonjour. I was just couldn't even like, oh, no. I couldn't even say it correctly. Such but I remember American. it was super, I was just like, oh my God, where am I? This is, uh, it just hit me. But I remember it was, uh, it was late June and all of the jasmine in this town was still in blossom. And there's about 3,000 people in this little town called Fagania. And I remember right when we kind of pulled into this town, it was absolutely you could just smell it you roll the windows down and it was like just a wall just packed with jasmine hmm. and i remember it was just so powerful and consuming and beautiful and i remember that just i can still every time i smell it here in the city i shove my face in the bush and just like get a whiff of it and just it brings me right back to that scared as hell excited as hell beautiful moment how old was that peter andrews 20. 20 years old. Was that, so this was before you were knighted? <laughs> before, yeah, I was knighted just a couple, like a year just ago. Pause, can we pause and have a moment on that? So you're a knight. Yes, I was, uh, I was knighted. What's that? Of what, of what extraction are you a knight? <laughs> so there's a, an, an ordinance in Northwestern Italy. So where I lived in Italy, the Jasmine story is in Northeast in a region called Friuli Venezia Giulia. And in the Northwest in Piemonte, where I lived and worked on a vineyard and worked harvest and made wine, I, uh, I fell in love with that culture immensely. And so when I came back to the States, moved to California, I worked for a uh, place called Prima, an amazing restaurant wine shop mm -hmm. that basically one of the first starters of Barolo and that those wines in America, it's particularly in California. And so we were kind of recognized by this it's called the Ordine del Cavalieri del Tartufo e dai Vini di Alba, which means of Knights of White Truffles and the Wines of Alba. 
Ooh. So it's it's a uh, it's, it's pretty special. If, if was there a, about, did, did they put a sword on your? Um, they hit you with a sword. <laughs> they use a Nebbiolo uh, trunk, so it's this long about the about my arm, and they they did it on and what, me. And and what an arm, Peter! Truly. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> so it was uh, it was pretty special, uh, pretty cool moment. So there's my boss was the first American to be knighted, and then I was probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe in the first 10. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, I've got a lot more questions for you, deep, personal, kind of biographical questions. Yeah. But why, don't we, why don't we put a pause on that and go into the history of wine? Love it. I love it. Um, so I was kind of thinking what we could do tonight um, is talk about, like, the history of the grapevine, kind of how it proliferated, basically how it got to what it is today, because it didn't just stop, start like a wine grapevine. And then we could talk about a few monumental moments in history and then talk about current events. Can I, um, can I pair while we do this though? Is that all right? So it yes, absolutely. But you have to eat it seductively. Eat it. Don't just eat the pear, like eat the pear. All right. Like really? Yeah. Now we're talking. Let's. <laughs> so the, the grapevine itself, um, it has many different kind of species. And so the one that we all know of is called Vitis vinifera, and that's Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, everything that we drink from wine. But that started from a different kind of species actually back in China, way, 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 way long ago. Okay. And so through like cross-pollination, human intervention, and then evolution, those are three ways that a grapevine can evolve. It kind of turned into the grapevine we know today. So wait, and so yeah, grapevine started in China. So the most yes, yeah, so the there are grapevines everywhere in the world, but most likely the vinifera, the one that started Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, everything that we drink, mm -hmm. um, that most likely way back in the day originated in China. I don't drink Chardonnay, but okay. Oh, I'm actually drinking a Burgundy right now, a white Burgundy, which is Chardonnay. So. Um, they, but kind of the wine that we know it today, there's kind of a primary and secondary center of evolution. And so the first was like in the, the Israel, Iran, Georgia area. And so it kind of started there. They were making wine in what's called in Georgia, they called them Kevri in uh, basically these earthenware pots. I think you have um, a photograph of it, don't you? Yeah, yeah, let me, uh, let me pull it up real quick. I can show you. Um, can you see the screen? I can. Cool. So there are basically three kind of examples here. So on the left, this, these big ones, I took, I took all these pictures. These are all from my travels throughout Europe. The one on the left is actually in Portugal, but this is an example of what they would look like in Georgia back at, you know, 4,000 BC. And they were made by hand. And uh, basically what they would happen is they would be planted or, 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 put into the ground like we see here in this picture on the top right. And so they would stay in place. They would take all the grapes, crush them with their feet, and then throw them in this container and then seal it. And then they wouldn't touch it for, for a year, two years, for however long. And so all these okay, things uh, would happen. Uh, yeah. How, how did they know to do that and like wine would come out of it? Like, you know how that started? Yeah, so most likely with wine, it you know, it we didn't know that wine that grapes could be turned into wine, right? Like all of these things were kind of amazing accidents. What's amazing about grapes, uh, in particular the vinifera vine, if if you want per like true like a some type of kind of truth that like there's a reason that it was meant for wine, there's a what's called a bloom on a grape skin, and that's yeast that comes from the ambient surroundings. There's yeast everywhere, right? Like in San Francisco, we have sourdough bread, right? That's our own unique yeast that's in the air. So there's this bloom that's on the grape skin that if all you need to do is pick the grape, and then when you're transporting it from point A to point B, the weight of it might crush, the juice might come out, and then the yeast that's on the skin would actually start fermenting. Hmm. So most likely they were transporting grapes they were growing wild. They were transported. And then, oh my God, this thing happened. It tastes kind of weird, but it makes me also feel funny. I don't know what's going on. I like it. Mm. And uh, that's kind of probably the beginning of it. Uh, and then it evolved, obviously, into humans 
wanting to make, you know, take control of that whole situation. And so these earthenware vessels would basically stay in place, but as humans started becoming more nomadic and, you know, finding new places to live and particularly, you know, like the Greek and the Romans taking over other cultures, they would use these smaller, uh, what we call amphora down here on the right. And so those, you can see a big difference here is there's handles on them, uh, all made from clay. But the, the whole point of this is that you can carry it. And so this was all about transport. And so way back in the day, kind of like a roadie. It's a roadie. This is the Greek roadie. Yeah. Okay. Um, so way back in the day, they would actually like brand them with their own, you know, the, the, the emblem of the particular ruler or of the town. And so basically when these archaeologists would unearth these like amazing sites, they would always find amphora. And the whole prem, then they would basically be able to go back. They would look at the grapevine history through the seeds that were left or the, or the tartaric acid. It's a wine making byproduct, or they could tell from what was left on the vessel. And so that's kind of how, how it, you know, kept going. If you had to stamp your personal stamp on a Greek roadie, what would it be? <laughs> Probably this big, nasty mustache I've going on right now. Okay. It's new. It's, it's wonderful. And so people would certainly recognize you for it. Okay, yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Should, we go to, um, should we go to the French Revolution or are we not there yet? Um, yeah, we can, we, can kind of, we can kind of kick it up a notch. We can, we can move forward. So we can, I'll just tell you quickly, it basically went from the Greeks to the Italians and then from the Italians, which, you know, the, the Romans kind of proliferated throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. And so just to wrap up the kind of earthenware point and into that French Revolution, the, um, the, we all know what, you know, barrels and we go into wineries in Napa and Napa and we see these barrels and it's like, how did we go from these earthenware pots to barrels? Yeah. And so basically the, the Northern Europeans, the Gauls and the Celts, they used barrels for their beer. And so when there was starting to be kind of commerce between these areas, the the romans saw that barrels were used and that's kind of how barrels started being incorporated because they're easier to transport than there's them for they break a hell of a lot it takes a lot to break them and then so over time they saw the wine would change in that and that's how wine started becoming aged in barrels got it to so the gauls yep so the french revolution that's we're kind of fast forwarding up to the night about the 19th century but basically don't let me rush you did i yeah. rush you? no, no all good man all the historian, I'm just the audience. I'm just <laughs> here with my pair. Um, so basically, as one of the main important parts of wine history was definitely the French Revolution. And uh, that was, you know, kind of on a social impact side. That was when, you know, the French rose up against the, the authority and the aristocracy. And so what Napoleon did after this which really created we still see this very heavily today is it he created what was called the napoleonic law you ever heard of this before no <laughs> yeah yeah you obviously know about this so the napoleonic law basically meant that basically stated that anyone who first off they stripped all of the rest of the vineyard land that was owned by the church because that was what was happening back then catholics ruled at that point it all became privatized and then from there to help ensure that wealthy landowners wouldn't continue to proliferate and own more, they would, they created the Napoleonic law, which meant, which stated at first it was only men and then eventually it became all children, but all of the boys in the family had to get equal share of an asset when, uh, when the father died. Okay. And so the vineyard land, one vineyard would become three if the, if the sons, you know, were, if he had three sons. Right. But what would happen is a lot of the times these, these owners didn't like, they wanted to do different things, right? So it created this family rift. And then each one of those three might have created their own labels of wine or their own businesses. Okay. And so that created what we call fragmentation in the, vine in the kind of winery culture and in, in France in particular. And so that's why like today when you drink Burgundy, there be, there'll be people who own like an acre of land and they're making wine from it. Mm -hmm. And that, make, that gives you like nothing. You can't sustain a lifestyle off of that. But it's because it's been passed down over generations, what may have been 10 acres way back in the day, by the time it gets to their generation, split up. I see, okay. So 
So thank you, Napoleon, for diversity. Yep. <laughs> but lines. so what happened in Burgundy that's super important is they were the first to kind of create this concept of like single vineyards. So when you go to the wine store, or when you go to Napa and Sonoma, and you're like, this is, they always take their, their best bottle. Like, this is our best prized cuvee. It's the single vineyard block of blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise of that started back in Burgundy with monks. And so basically they would, they were the ones because wine was like grapevines were transported. They were planted. They, you know, they evolved and changed over time, but people were making wine and it wasn't like, this is a great Pinot Noir. That wasn't what was happening back then. They were, yeah. they were transporting it in barrels and selling it in barrels. And it just wasn't thought of the way we have it today. So the was monks there, the, was there white and red wine or was it just like mush pot? So there was kind of a mix. There was definitely not white, like white wine. We know of it today until like the 19th century. Okay. Um, you know, that kind of an interesting thing is, you know, orange wine and natural wines are like such a big topic today with like millennials. Yeah. And that kind of started with those, those amphora we looked at earlier because it's basically fermenting it with the skins and yeah. you create this orangey, funky oxidized style of wine, but that's not like the normal wine we're used to. Yeah. Um, but, but long story short, these monks, you know, all the way back, even in the 14th century, they would basically take notes of these vineyards and they were, they were, they had three things in life that, that mattered to them, prayer, sleeping, and wine consumption. Was that, that, was that very classic of them? I mean, was that allowed? Well, they were Cistercian and that was like their thing. I don't know. I, it sounds like, you know, if you're going to go celibate, I guess that kind yeah. of is the, Listen, if I were to sell a bit, I'd be drinking a lot of wine too. <laughs> There's like, I mean, what the hell else are you going to do? I don't so, know. Just drink wine, I guess, and pray. So these, these monks, they would get what's called a hemina, which was like a daily ration, which was half a pint, half a bottle, or excuse me, a pint, half a bottle of wine. Okay. And only if they did their hard work and their prayer. And so, but they would, they would look at these vineyards in Burgundy and say, wow, that, that vine is doing really well. That vineyard's doing really well. That one's not. It, this particular grape does really well here. Why does this one not? Um, and so they would basically study. They were the first to do this. Mm -hmm. And so they created this concept. And uh, if you ever see on a grape, on a, on a bottle of wine from Burgundy, a clo, which is C-L-O-S, it means it's a walled-in vineyard. And that all started from those monks. Got and it. so everything that was 14th century. So everything that we know of today from single vineyards, from, from really studying what happens in these soils, these vines, these grapes, that all started from these monks in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. um, so Burgundy, yeah. After the French revolution, no, before the French revolution, fuck. Well before, like 500 years before. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, man. The French revolution. Okay. So the probably the next biggest this definitely is the biggest thing that's ever happened to the wine industry is this thing called phylloxera and uh basically it's like the wine me? what's that what did you call me i call here a phylloxera, ah, what's a, so, phylloxera? a phylloxera it's a little it's like an aphid have you ever grown tomatoes before i have not dude come on you got this beautiful new house well you need to, house, well, apartment and, sorry and and I've purchased tomatoes from the supermarket. Okay. So if you can ever, if you ever plant them, one of the biggest things that ever happens is you get these little aphids and they live under the leaves. Okay. And so the, the wine industry had that happen in the late 1800s. They would, during the late 1800s, there was a big Victorian culture and the wealthy wanted plants and these extravagant gardens and they would pay any cost to get them from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But there was no such thing as quarantining back then. And so, and it's something we obviously know a lot about today, right? Yes. And uh, so these wealthy elites would say, we're going to take, send us whatever, you, send it, I don't care. And so they would send these plants over to England. And a lot of the times they would come from America, from the South, from Mexico as well. And they would bring these little aphids. And so this aphid called phylloxera attacks the root louse of a, of a vine and it kills a vineyard. Once it's there, your vineyard's dead. You have no chance. Okay. We never knew it existed. No one knew it existed at this time. So it hit Europe in the 1800s, late 1800s, 63. And by 1890, 
the almost all of the wine production in Europe was wiped out because of this aphid. Yeah. And so they, what, what was learned is that that Vitis vinifera that we talked about, a lot of people call it the European grapevine. If you grafted it with an American rootstock, then you could replant and the phylloxera wouldn't attack it. Why? So phylloxera came from America. So it's like brute, brute American strength? Or? Total, man. And we, we, right. we, we crafted the most like bionic, hardcore, deadly aphid there is. Yeah, total, yeah. like go America. Okay, yeah. Sweet. And uh, so after decades of this happening, they realized that this is how you fix it. It comes from America. Let's use American wild vines. It's resistant. We graft it. You basically create like a, called a scion. You put it together and then that's what you plant. And um, that changed the industry forever because now 90% roughly of all grapevines in the world are grafted. Meaning, what does grafted mean? They're like, basically like they're a mutant kind of? They're not they're not just like a plant, right? They're not just like a grapevine. This would be like one grapevine by itself. So maybe this part here is the American rootstock. So it's a totally different one. Called like, well, there's one like, you know, Manischewitz, you ever heard of that before? I know what Manischewitz is. <laughs> so Manischewitz is the Concord grape, which is Labrusca. Mm -hmm. It's not Vitis vinifera, it's Vitis Labrusca. And okay. so you would take the Concord grapevine, and you would put it into the ground with the Cabernet on top. I see. And the phylloxera can't attack the Cabernet because only the Concord is in the ground. So a lot of our wines have some bionic piece of American root in them, is what you're saying. Totally, man. Yep. Because of a big phylloxera outbreak in 1863. I'm learning so much. This is amazing. I'm not so, anything else. All right. What's, okay, so that happens. So the crazy thing is, it, even today, that's still important. There are vineyards who, when they plant, they only use grafted vines. Now, back to that natural wine thing, they, so many of the natural wine producers are like, we're only using own rooted vines. So that's what that means. We're not using grafted. We don't mm -hmm. care about flocks or we're going to take the risk because we believe that if we're entirely coming from the Cabernet vine from root to stock to, okay. to grape, it's going to give you all the characteristics of Cabernet and nothing else. Okay. And so that is kind of a thing. So if you ever see own rooted on a label or in, in, a, in a tasting, that's kind of what they're talking about. I'm just going to think they have a problem with my country. Yes. <laughs> so what happens after that? So basically everyone had to restart. So there were a lot of winemakers who were very, very, very poor. And they, a lot of them left Europe. And a lot of them took literal cuttings with them in a backpack, 100 cuttings, because you don't plant a seed to make a grapevine, you plant a cutting. They took it with them and they left. Italians went to Argentina, French went to Argentina, uh, a lot of Europeans came to America and they brought grapevines with them and they replanted there. And then the whole industry started again. Wow. So, kind of like we're seeing now where we're all stuck inside and we're like, what the hell do we do when we restart this? something terrible happened and it affected everybody but in the end it completely changed the industry and the wine world for the better it was wow. terrible for a long time terrible but in the end we have an incredible industry of winemaking all over the world and so much of that started from this phylloxera outbreak and these people leaving and starting over again wow that is amazing i can't believe i never heard about that and of course 1863 is right when the civil war happened Ah, oh, man, I didn't even know that. That was the start. You teach me, I teach you. Oh, attaboy. Yes. So, so then World War II, I think. Yeah, next. so that, that basically right when we were all done with phylloxera in like 1920, mm -hmm. we hit prohibition in the U.S. Damn. Followed by World Damn. War II in Europe and the rest wow. of the world. So World War II was crazy. It really affected European wine in particular. Obviously, the battles were fought there. So like, for instance, in Champagne, there's some really amazing, crazy stories. The Nazis had a person they called the wine father or the vine feuer. And this guy's entire task was to go to the top regions in France, because by then everyone knew France was the best wine production area in Europe. Okay. So they would, he was actually tasked with sending the Nazi troops, as well as Hitler, the best wines of France. 
So he had to get 400,000 bottles of champagne from, from champagne per week. That was what his task was. So this was happening in Bordeaux. It was so bad in the Loire Valley, which is just west of, of Champagne. Beautiful is that where Pinot is from? What's that? Is that where Pinot Noir is from? Pinot Noir comes from Burgundy, Not which was also very Valley. heavily hit. What's that? Not from the Noir Valley? No, Loire, L. Oh, Loire. Okay, sorry, I heard that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, one, one truly amazing story is these winemakers all banded together, and they were, they were like, I can't sell wine right now. I need to produce to keep a living mm -hmm. and keep this going because obviously grapevines produce wine every year. So how can we get through this? How can we make our best wine but not give it to the Nazis? How mm -hmm. can we hide it? How can we not let them have this? We give them our plonk and we keep our best for when these bastards are out of here. We have something to start over again. Yeah. And so in, in the Loire Valley, for instance, a lot of the vineyards and the, and the wineries are are carved into the chalk cave soils. And so these guys, there's, a, there's stories of these winemakers who literally took all their best wine and they put it into the caves and then they filled the cave with the chalk that they, you know, that they used to extract and make the cave out of. And then they would literally would plant bushes there and put bushes there to hide the wine. Wow. And so there's one really famous story of this amazing winery in Loire called Huey, which everyone should try. It's, it's H-U-E-T, Domaine Huey. The guy got taken away by the Nazis and was in, in, in camp. He was, he was considered part of the resistance. And he, he shockingly survived, but he was in, in jail for, for years. When he came back, he went immediately to the cave, saw that the bush was still there, took away the stones and found all of his wine still there hidden from wow. the houses. Amazing. So huh. it, it was crazy. I mean, there's stuff like that everywhere. So World War II affected because it was a seven year period where wine, they, there was nothing really, everything that was good that was produced mostly went, went to the Nazis, unfortunately. So it, made, it really changed everything. And how did prohibition affect the wine, the history of wine and the wine industry? So, Prohibition was from 1920 to 1933. It's a really, really long time. Mm. And it basically turned the U.S. into kind of, we were on this amazing path to be rivaling Europe. Mm -hmm. All of these Europeans left Europe after phylloxera. They brought these vines. They established this wine industry. We had the 1849 gold rush. You know, San Francisco was booming. The Bay Area was booming. Napa, Sonoma was starting to explode. And then prohibition happened, stopped. We went from having something like 2,000 wineries. By the time it was done, we had less than 100. Wow. And what happened is there were all these stupid loopholes in it that allowed people to make wine, but only if it was for sacrament, if it was proved to be for these particular things. Mm -hmm. So what happened is, People were getting wine whatever way they could, but it wasn't good quality. Yeah. So I've, never, I've that, never had sacrament wine, but I imagine it's not renowned for its quality. I, I, I don't think so. I've, I've, I haven't either, sadly. Um, but Anyone that's tuned in has had sacrament wine, let us know. I yeah. <laughs> so the, there were these things called raisin cakes, for example. And so people would, would take the grapes. You were allowed to keep the vineyard, as long as you were told, you know, as you were promising that it was used for these things. So people would keep the vineyard as long as they could. And they would basically take the grape juice, they would cook it down with the skins and make into this like brick and they would call it a raisin cake. And then they would sell it and it would have explicit instructions on how not to make wine. You feel me? You picking up on and putting down what they're doing? I'm drinking your quarts of water, yes. <laughs> so they would basically, this is what people started to know wine as. They would buy these raisin cakes, and then they would use the instructions on how not to make wine to make wine to be able to drink. <sighs> and so by the time Prohibition was done, people's perception of what wine was was, screw, was effed completely. Raisin cake. It's awful. Yeah. If that never happened we would have had this long steady period of growth where the U S which we've kind of rebounded, but we would have been like truly yeah. one of the top producers hands down. Definitely like not the best decision in prohibition. Really dumb, really, yeah. really, really stupid decision. Yeah. So 
one of the things that it did when it was done is it created these laws, what we know of today called the three tier system. And so that was basically the federal government didn't want to regulate it anymore other than taking in taxes. So they said, you need to work. The producer has to sell to a distributor. A distributor has to sell to a retailer or a restaurant, a retailer or a restaurant to sell to the consumer. So it has to go through these steps and every state manages it and creates their own laws around it. This is today. Today. So that started from prohibition in 33 and still exists today. And so, and I'll tie this into what's going on today because we, we still have to deal with these archaic laws that don't make sense in today's marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why they're still like, for instance, I run a retail program I have for 10 years now. I can only ship legally to 14 states in the U S why because of these prohibition laws that are set from back in thirties and they're still being enforced. However, if I'm a winery, I can ship direct to consumer in 45 States Mm -hmm. makes no sense. What's happening is there's a lobbying firm, very, 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 very well funded, funded lobbying firm by the distributors who are able to fund state, government fund, you know, state, uh, uh, political races. So these people will keep these laws in place because it helps. Yeah. Because it helps the licensed retailer or licensed distributors in each state keep their cycle going. Got it. Got it. Got it. But in today's world, Uh, there's so much out there. There's so much options, varieties of spice of life. Consumers are getting hindered by this. So it's a, it's something we're dealing with every day. Well, how is the coronavirus affecting the wine industry right now? Well, obviously, it's, it's crushing it pretty heavy. I mean, I have, I have friends that I've spoken to, uh, to go back to champagne. He, he's a champagne importer. He imports for a company called Esprit de Champagne. They import incredible small producers, mm-hmm. like over half of his business has been restaurants. And so overnight he's now become a wine delivery guy. Right. And so if you like to drink champagne, he'll literally, you can buy it from him direct from the importer and then he'll deliver it to you. Before this started, that would be illegal. But in California, they basically like disbanded all the laws to allow these retailers and restaurants and distributors and importers to sell direct to consumer. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I just want to make an announcement. If anyone has questions for Peter about the history of wine, how coronavirus has affected wine, rosé, how the industry is being affected right now, we're going to extend our time for about five, 10 more minutes. So you can go ahead and type your questions in now for Peter. So if you have a question for Peter about the history of wine or anything he just said, uh, or about how the wine industry is being affected by this, go ahead and type your question in now. Um, okay, I have like one more like rando historical question and then I wanna get yeah. into the break. How did Rosé start? Okay, how did Rosé start? Was okay. Rosé not a thing? And also like, why do you think Rosé is so popular right now? Dude, rosé is just like on this boom, man. And it has been for about 10 years now. It's been around for a long time. It is made in a few different ways. Um, the most common way uh, for the best high quality stuff, like the Provence, the Southern French stuff, they would, you know, when you make red wine, you take the red grapes and you press them, you get the juice, crush them, you get the juice, then you press. And so the, the skin is what gives all the color whether it's a red grape or a white grape, all color comes from the skin. Got it. And so if you want to make a rosé, rather than, you know, if you want to make rather, if you want to make a red wine, you crush the grapes in the, in the juice and you macerate it and you let it sit inside of it. And then all the color starts coming out. You also get tannin flavor, right? If you want to make rosé, instead of crushing, you press the grapes really delicately and that juice coming through the skin creates pink. And then you ferment it like a white one. That's what makes it pink? Yeah. Very, very delicate pressing. And why do you think it's been so popular? Um, I think it's just like, it's, it's lively. It's fun. It's easy. It's cheap. Um, The color is beautiful. I mean, how can you not love that? Like pretty, like light pink drink. It's like my idea of heaven pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. What? So there's other ways like white Zinfandel that are, that it's made and it's not made that carefully and pretty, but we, we can cover that another time. What, why do you think, you know, there's so many different beverages out there, right? And I studied the, the history of coffee in advance of opening Manny's and kind of the like, how it became this drink in our culture. 
Um, I imagine there are a lot of different ways to get a fix from a beverage, you know, and, eat, and even different kind of alcoholic beverages. But like, why do you think wine has occupied this very central role in our society for, as you've said today, you know, thousands of years? It's crazy. I mean, it, there's something powerful about it. I mean, I can, there's so many answers to that question, but I would say one of my, one of the things that's drawn me into it and why I could see that it's, it's grown the way it has over the years is that humans are connected to memories by scent and taste, mm -hmm. right? Like imagine if you went to your grandma's house and you smelled, or you smell, you were walking by a restaurant and you smelled this dish, like, oh my God, my grandma, it just hits you. And you remember this house, you remember these memories, you remember love, you remember laughter, crying, fights, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, wine has a powerful set of, of aromatics and flavors that are absolutely tied to memory. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a huge part of it. I, th I think that wine is also has obviously shared in places in the current times over the last hundred plus years, it's shared in really important memories and times of your life. Mm -hmm. And so that again, brings you back. You taste that bottle a year later after that special event and it hits you. That smell brings you right back to that moment. And you can like, I get goosebumps talking about it. I mean, it's such a special thing. Yeah. I mean, it is also a religious and ritualistic beverage. I mean, Jews, Absolutely. Jews have a special blessing that you say over the wine that is different than what you would say over meat or, or vegetables or fruit. There's a special um, blessing for the wine. And we have to drink wine at the Sabbath and the synagogue. I mean, we have so many religious rituals around wine. Um, and I know, obviously, we said it somewhat um, you know, uh, jokingly, but the, the Christians, obviously, the Christian faith has a deep, deep connection to the Ryan, the Muslim faith is not, but, um, you know, here it doesn't have this, like, deep religious connection, but wine does, and so I'm sure that's something that's probably also brought it through the ages. I want to get this. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so just to, like, bring it to, you know, the Mission grape is a grape that is, uh, is kind of native to California, there's a guy named uh, Junipero Serra, who all of you guys know who are from California, probably to write papers on him when you were growing up. This missionary came up from, from Mexico while it was obviously still Mexico here, and he brought with him, and so he stopped and created these, these, these missionary outposts all the way along the, 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 um, the Real, right? And so he, obviously, because of sacrament, he bought grapevines with him, and so the mission grape was the first ever grape in California. And that's that what started in Sonoma? So that's what, that made it all the way up to Sonoma into what's now Buena Vista Winery. That's a very historic site for California wine. And then as people realized, oh my God, wine is something I want to drink for enjoyment rather than just sacrament, then they started planting other grapes. And that's when, you know, cue the Europeans coming in with their backpack full of grapevines. Boom, like everything started. Got it. Okay, let's get some of these questions. Abriana Casper, who has lots of questions and things to say, has asked, I'd like to know what Peter's favorite wine is and why is some wine so expensive? <laughs> um, my favorite wine is, is definitely Barolo. Um, it's the wine that comes from the, where I lived in Northwestern Italy and where I was, you know, knighted. Um, and it ties back into what I was saying. I mean, there's the, I, when I lived in Italy, I remember we would wake up at like five in the morning and pick grapes all day get it into the winery, do everything we needed to do, and then be done by 10, and then we'd have dinner. And I remember drinking Barolo uh, at dinner with this long table of exhausted people and just feeling just the sense of accomplishment and the sense of love and just like, holy shit, I love every minute of this. Mm -hmm. And we that smell and taste every time I have it right there, right at that table, right with those people, right with those smells, just like boom. So. Okay. Oh my God. We actually have like a ton of questions. So I'm going to try to get through a couple more. Steven oh, Clapp, 25% yeah. tariffs. Are they going to go away anytime soon? Has there uh, been movement on this? Uh, so yeah. It's killing many small suppliers. Yeah. There's this big tariff thing that our, our jerk in chief uh, enacted on Europe in October. Um, French wine, other than champagne, that's under 14%. Spanish wine, under 14%. German wine, under 14%. All get a 25% tariff of value of their cost to import. So that started in October. Um, 
brutal. There's no, there's nothing on the docket for it to go away. Um, we, I've been told that was just to protect our industry. Yeah, it's very, it's very protectionism. It's also, it was all started because of it's, we're going to go down a rabbit hole, but it was started because of, um, basically this Boeing, this, uh, world trade organization was against Boeing getting subsidies and so, or Airbus rather. And so the U S enacted tariffs on European handbags, olive oil, cheese, wine, because the U the EU gave subsidies to this. Right. And then of course, coronavirus, Boeing, Delta, all just got subsidies, right? Right. But we're not going to, of course, we're not going to lift it. All right. Jelaine asks, do you think the current ABC changes in the Free the Great movement has a chance of disrupting the three-tier system? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, hi, Jelaine, by the way. Um, she's the best, one of our best friend's moms. Um, the three-tier system is definitely not going to go away anytime soon. It's too entrenched with people who are donating way too much money to the political, the people in power. Um, there, there was a, I, I don't think that these ABC laws that have changed are going to stay in place. They, they'll go back. However, there was a huge Supreme Court win in Tennessee in June that sets the precedent, which is very important. It sets the precedent for retailers to be able to ship into that state. That precedent is going to take, take every one of those other 40 or 30 states down who don't allow retailers to ship in, that's going to take them down one by one as people decide to sue the state. It'll take 10 to 15 years, but that'll, that precedent was crucial for us changing a lot of things. All right. Erwin Feinberg asks, is there any wine actually worth a price of say $10,000 or more a bottle, which goes back to, um, uh, Aubriana's question of like, you know, why is some wine so expensive? Yeah, I mean, today's world is crazy. Where I work, I see, I saw a guy buy $30,000 worth of wine today, for instance, at my, at my. How many bottles was that? That was, uh, I mean, he was buying quite a bit. It was, it was somewhere around 10 cases of wine, which is still average bottles, insane. But the, there's very much a prestige around wine that I think is very unrelated to the things we've talked about, the passion, the nostalgia, that becomes a lot of the times those wines become about collecting to resell. There's a secondary market for a lot of wine. The wines that fetch those kind of prices are able to resell a lot of the times for even more money. So is it worth it to drink? No. Uh, there's a guy in this talk who has shared with me a very, very, very rare bottle of, of Burgundy called Domaine de la Romane Conti. And when he brought it over, I told him to bring that shit home and sell it and go on a trip around the world but he generously shared it with me and it's like a highlight of my wine drinking life. So. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. Well, great wine is meant to be consumed. Gok, yeah. Gok asks in parallel to Manny's Rosé question, how did the dessert wine become a thing? Uh, well, so a lot of dessert wine was made. Uh, there's a couple different ways, but there's a thing called Vinsanto, right? The saints wine. And so that, that was very heavily related to sacrament. But also what would happen is uh, a lot of places would take grapes and they would harvest them and then they would, they would dry them on mats and turn them into raisins. This actually was how Egyptians made wine. This was, it, it went from China to kind of Iran area, Egypt to Greece, to Italy, the rest of the world. And they just drink dessert wine. And so, yeah, they would, it was hot as hell. It was sunny. You know, you had very easy climate to make raisins. Mm -hmm. And so they would, they would, harvest the grapes, let it sit in the sun, dry, and then they would press it. And so you would lose like 70% of the juice in the skin and the grape. But what you had left was like nectar. Super sweet. And, and what happens there, the reason why it was sweet is because yeast cannot, back then, especially yeast isn't powerful enough to eat all that sugar. So it'll die. It'll ferment to like 7% and then die. So you're left with this slightly alcoholic, very lusciously sweet wine. And that's kind of there are regions who be became very famous for doing this, like Saltern, um, Tokai in Hungary, a lot of places like that. Let's try to get to a couple more of these questions. Ross asks, you're doing a great job answering them questions quickly. I don't want you to think that you're not doing a great job. There's just a lot of them. And so, <laughs> you know, actually, you sh not all the time with the questions so good, but a lot of good questions. Ross asks, does wine predate all other alcoholic beverages? No, beer is the oldest. Okay. Uh, not much, but beer is the oldest. Um, beer is the oldest. Sangeeta. Great question, Sangeeta. 
it's probably like that would take like a whole nother conversation to do it, but let's see if Peter's got a, a short answer. So you did, if I walk into Whole Foods and want to drink a wine I've never had before, are there rules of thumb to follow when choosing a bottle? Let's say I know I like reds, not too sweet. Anything else I need to know that can help me make a decision because I just picked the coolest looking bottle, not a consistent strategy. Sangeeta, I am with you. I picked the yeah. coolest bottle and it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Shopping for wine is frustrating. There's so many labels, it's hard. I would say if you can, it's obviously not easy to go to a second place to shop, but what I would do, what I always recommend if you're really trying to discover wine and really fall in love with it and really learn about it, find a retailer that you like build a relationship with them, like a wine retailer, build a relationship with them and tr put your trust in them. And this is a big part of what my career has been is you, you go to them and you explain to them what you like and you, 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 you know, hopefully they're not, if, if they're pretentious at all, keep going. Yeah. But if you find someone who you trust and can talk to you about wine, like it's, it's just this beautiful thing and they're not waxing poetic and they're treating you like, you know, you're learning and you're having fun with it. And you can go in there and build this rapport with them and really do it up and really create this. They can then eventually they'll just say, Hey, uh, I know what you like. This just came in Buy this yeah. and it becomes easy. And you know, Sangeeta support your small businesses. You know what I mean? Wine yeah. shops in San Francisco, we need your love and support. So I know every, every crucial corridor for the most part has a wine shop. Um, and I need to find mine in the Castro. So maybe I should go to the one on 19th. Um, I like Ken's question. Ken wants to know about Manischewitz. Maybe you don't know the answer to this, but basically he wants to know why is Manischewitz so undrinkable? So, <laughs> so Manischewitz, if you were at the beginning of the, of the talk, we talked about Vitis vinifera, right? The European grape. That's the, the, the uh, species of grape that makes all wine that we drink. Now there's other species that makes wines. Vitis labrusca, Riparia, Berlandieri. Those make wines that are not of good quality. Concord grape that makes Manischewitz is from the uh, Labrusca species. And it's all about that species does not make good quality wine. However, it grows a shitload of grapes on one vine. And that's why Manischewitz uses it. It's cheap and easy to produce. What are you trying to say? It's cheap. You're cheap, Manny. <laughs> All right, Katie's, the final question goes to Katie. Also, I, want, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm literally going out of my apartment and getting a bottle of wine after this because I have no good wine. I just have really, really bad wine. And now I've been watching you drink that white burgundy and I want to go to Pump Jack or something and get a bottle of wine. Katie gets the final question. What wine will you pour for friends and share on the day that we get wine together again in a park after shelter and place orders are oh. God, that's such a good question. I think, I mean, champagne, man. Champagne is just like, I could drink that in any occasion. And there's just, there's nothing like it. It is just, obviously, bubbles or celebratory. Popping that cork and shooting it into the sky at the park. I'm going to get a big bottle of champagne. And we're all going to share it. And we're all going to hug each other. And we're all going to just enjoy it so much. It's going to be a special, special day. Is there a particular like kind of champagne that you like to get that the rest of us can partake in? Like what would yeah. you recommend? So I mentioned uh, earlier, there's this guy, my good friend, Brandon, um, if, if I can send it to you, maybe you can share it later. I don't know how, but yeah. or if you guys want to Google or Instagram, look up um, Esprit de Champagne. Uh, I might, it might be Champagne. E-S-P-R-I-T de Champagne. Okay. The guy's name is Brandon Mueller, M-U-E-M-U-E-L-L-E-R. Um, he he imports one called Boche Lemoine, and uh, this family producer, uh, absolutely stellar wines, super well priced, and and he delivers them to your door. Will you send me the link and I'll send it to everyone afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. As we close up, I just want to take a second and ask you guys to focus on my screen for a second because we've been on, also focusing on Peter before this. I don't know what's going on with my head. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Anyway, um, Manny's is closed and so we are asking everyone that tunes into these talks to consider becoming a sponsor of my small business. We need money, people. Do it, everyone. Do it. Put it shut. And I want to keep doing this. I love my job. I love what I do. I love my small business. And I am scared that we may not be able to make it because it's going to be a really long, slow recovery. And so we're asking everyone 
to consider becoming a monthly sponsor. It's $36 a month. You go to joinit.org slash o slash manus. And that consistent support is what we're going to need in order to be able to, to, to roll with the punches and, and, and reopen full force when we really can. So please consider becoming a sponsor. You can also go to the answered section in the Q&A box. My staff, thankfully, has put uh, the link to become a sponsor, so you can just click it and become a sponsor. I also want to thank um, my staff here. Um, this is, they're not this small, but we just had a picture of them. Next to me, it's Sam, Ram, and Jupiter. And Jupiter is the operator for this call, so thank you, Jupiter, for that. And finally, I want to thank my, my friend Peter. You are, you know, you bring brains and brawn, brilliance and beauty. You are so good at what you do, and I'm honored to know you. Um, and thanks. Thanks for doing oh, that. Oh, man. I thank you. It's a treat. You've spoken to, like, heroes of, of me and so many people in this in, in that have tuned in tonight. So it's... It's an honor to share a, a Zoom screen with them at uh, various points. I mean, really, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Well, you're a hero to me as well. I love you, man. I'll see you soon. Bye. See you. Thanks, right, everyone. Thank you. Again.